Friday night took care of my weekday blues I woke up at breakfast and read the news I'm feeling relaxed, refreshed and renewed But I feel like there's something I'm forgetting to do Hey, uh, Toby, the uh, show's about to start Oh yeah It's a Saturday show It's a Saturday show it's a Saturday show. 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 Hey, Toby, what are you doing? Oh, hey Otto. Well, it's a beautiful day, so I decided I'd do some wood carving outside. Carving? What are you making? Yeah, it's an owl. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, real cool. Can I keep it? Yeah, I was making it for you. This is awesome, Toby. I didn't know you were an artist. Well, carving is one form of art that I really like. I mean, I do like paintings and sculptures, but there's something about this type of folk art that's just really tangible. Folk art? Folk art is a type of art. It's pretty hard to define, but the Museum of International Folk Art does a pretty good job. Here, let's take a look at this list, Otto. So it says here that folk art can be decorative or utilitarian, which means that the object has a use beyond being cool to look at. It can be made by people who learned formally, like in a school or informally, or by teaching themselves. It can be an everyday object or one that's saved for a special ceremony. It includes things like music and dancing and food. It can be made for use within a community or it can be made for sale as a form of income and empowerment. It's traditional, it reflects shared cultural aesthetics and social issues, and folk art is of, by, and for the people, all people, inclusive of class, status, culture, community, ethnicity, gender, and religion. Wow, Toby, that is a lot to take in. Do you think you could show me some more about folk art? I sure can, Otto. Today we'll look at two different types of folk art carving, and then I'll show everyone a project that they can do at home. But before we get to it, let's see what the word of the day is. Kashi and Christopher? <laughs> hey, Kashi, what are you doing? Oh, hi, Christopher. Oh, can you take this from me, please? <laughs> sure. Uh, uh, so, hi, Christopher. I was just painting. Wow, Kashi, it looks beautiful. Do you like my beret? I love your beret. It's my painter's hat. Wow. It's Does, French. And I'll bet it inspires you. Oh, yeah. Wow, that's great. And is this a Bob Ross? Oh, yeah. How do you know him? <laughs> oh, uh, I've seen his programs at the library. Yeah, you just start with one thing and then you add more and more and then you're done. Well, isn't that wonderful? And art is so much fun, too. Oh, I love art. Well, hey, Kashi, shall we see what Lexi has for us today? Yes, she was holding my painting for me, so we have to move it. <laughs> All right. I'll just set this down here. And are you ready to hit the button? I am. Okay, here we go. Well, Kashi, let's see what it says. Okay. Wow. Can you read it? It says, still life. Yeah, what's a still life? Um, I think it has something to do with art. Right. Well, you know, a still life is when you set up different inanimate objects and you try to recreate them with a painting or a drawing. Well, you know what, Kashi? You've got enough on your table right now while we could make a quick still life. Oh, 
cool. Look at this. So you put things on the table and then you paint them or draw them. Right. And it's called still life because they're not moving. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And look at this. We've got a plate of some delicious potatoes and ginger and kiwis and jalapenos. We've got a bottle with these flowers in it and a pitcher and a glass. I think that glass would be very hard to draw. It would be. Well, listen, are you, do you have a uh, summer game code ready oh, for yes, us? Oh, yes, I do. I have some clues for you. <laughs> So this word means when you take a bunch of different things and you put them into a picture together. Like you could take something and cut it out of paper and then you glue something on and you can put sparkles and it can be all sorts of different things. Also, clue number two is it is a French word and... Mm. Uh, it has six letters, is that right? Seven! It has seven letters! Wow! Well, if you think you know the answer, you can go to play.aadl.org for big points. Sounds good. And I think we're going to get back to our painting. Yay. <laughs> Bye. Bye. All right, Otto, check this out. Wow, it's so colorful and um, it's kind of spiritual. That's the idea, bud. This here is an alabrije that was made in Oaxaca, Mexico. They have a long tradition of carving wood in Oaxaca, but these alabrijes actually have their roots in paper crafting. Here, check it out. Mexico, 1936. In 1936, Mexican artisan Pedro Linares fell ill. While he was sick, he fell asleep and had a strange dream. He was in a land of trees and rocks and clouds, and suddenly strange creatures appeared. They were wondrously colorful and looked like several different animals mixed together, and they were all saying, Alabrijes! Alabrijes! When Pedro got better, he set to work recreating the animals he saw in his dream out of cartonaria, a version of paper mache. His alabrijes became very popular all over Mexico and eventually all over North America. The carved wooden alabrijes that come from Oaxaca were popularized by Manuel Juan Jimenez Ramirez, whose carvings became popular in both Mexico and the United States by the end of the 1960s. He kept his knowledge a secret, sharing it with only his family. But as time went on, more and more people in his hometown of Arizona began carving alabrijes to sell to tourists who came to visit Monte Alban, a historic pyramid complex located near the city. Twenty miles away and ten years later, in the town of San Martín Tocajete, the production of alabrijes was popularized by Isidoro Cruz, an artist and woodcarver who was recruited by the Mexican National Tourist Council to share his knowledge and skills with the people of San Martín Tocajete. Today, a large portion of the city's economy is based on artisan production. Now, some people contend that the alabrije was not a result of a feverish dream, but either way, their impact is undeniable, and in 1990, Pedro Linares was given the National Prize for Popular Arts and Traditions by the Mexican government. But, life is always a little more fun when there's a good story to be told. I really like that story, Toby. Do you think we can carve an alabrije? Well, Otto, I think we can leave that to the people and the families that originated them and make them today. Well, that's fair. What else you got? Well, let's take a break and watch a couple segments before we move on. All right. Do you have a favorite artist? When I was younger, I definitely had a favorite. The Spanish painter Salvador Dali. <laughs> I liked him partly because he had a crazy personality, with a mustache to match. I also liked his weird paintings. They seemed to make strange things appear familiar, and familiar things look strange. Dali was part of an art movement called Surrealism. The Surrealists were a group of people who focused on the world of dreams in order to create a new reality, a reality that was beyond real, or surreal. We've all awakened from dreams that were very vivid, but 
didn't quite make sense. While Dali and other surrealist artists paid attention to their dreams because they felt their dreams reflected their deepest thoughts, desires, and struggles. Here's one of his most famous paintings, titled The Persistence of Memory, which Dali finished in 1931 when he was 27 years old. First, let's look at those clocks. They're melting, and they're attracting ants and a fly. For some reason, or maybe for no reason, the cold, hard metal is soft and smelly. Next, let's look at those cliffs off in the distance. They're painted very realistically and very beautifully. I can almost feel the morning sun as I look at them. Maybe these cliffs are a memory of a real place Dali visited. Finally, let's look at that rumpled shape at the painting center. Do you see the eyebrow, the nose, and the long eyelashes? Maybe it's a face, a very peaceful face. I love the watch that's draped over it, resting very calmly. That was fun. If you'd like to learn more about surrealism, you can check out this book from the library or explore the video linked on the Saturday Shows page. As they say in Spain, adios! Hi, welcome to What Is It? I have one, two, three, four, five, six items that are all the same thing. Kind of squishy. Squishy too, especially when you work it for a while. What? Whose brain is that? Removable. Who needs a cow suit? Who needs a cow nose? Who needs a cow head? And lastly, just a little samurai. What is it?
Okay, Otto, I'm glad you like the Alabrijes, but now we're going to move from southern Mexico to the Pacific coast of Canada and Alaska. Oh boy, I'll trade out my t-shirt for a turtleneck. What are we looking at next? Well, these objects have a complex history and have been presented in many different ways, but we'll try and sort it out. Here, take a look. Perhaps the most recognizable form of native art in North America is the totem pole. First created in pre-Columbian times, that means before Europeans reached North America, by groups of indigenous people in the Pacific Northwest, these beautiful carved poles hold significant meaning outside of their appearance. The Tlingit, Haida, Shimshan, Newhalk, Quackayutl, Nushanuth, and the Salish culture groups inhabited land on the Pacific coast of North America in areas that are now Washington State, British Columbia, and Alaska. While different in many ways, each of these cultures had elaborate social and ceremonial structures. Before Europeans arrived, the totem pole was commissioned by a village chief to record achievements, family history, storytelling, and wealth. After Europeans arrived and the trade of sea otter furs brought European wealth to the area, totem poles became larger and more prevalent as village chiefs accumulated more wealth. By the early 1900s, indigenous culture and carving was in decline, most likely because of the policies of the Canadian government, which included the banning of the potlatch ceremony. However, some indigenous people continued to practice their traditions and customs in secret, and some even continued to carve masks, feast dishes, and other items. Charlie James, born in 1867, continued to carve and taught his stepson, Mungo Martin, the skill of carving. Mungo, Willie Seaweed, and many others continued these traditions well into the 1960s. The ban on the potlatch ceremony was lifted in 1951, and the people of the Pacific Northwest began celebrating the potlatch and raising totem poles with renewed energy. But what about the poles themselves, you may ask? Well, here goes. The poles are carved from a single tree, almost always a western red cedar tree. The trees are laid on their sides and the artist begins to carve based on the instructions from the person who commissioned the pole. The pole is often topped with the crest of the commissioner's family. There are several different types of totem poles, not just the freestanding ones you might have seen. There were poles carved inside of dwellings, which told the history of a particular family or group. There were entrance poles that greeted people as they entered a house. There were portal poles that had huge ovals carved in them so that people would enter a building through the totem pole itself. There were memorial poles, mortuary poles, shame poles, and today, commercial poles. These are created for non-indigenous groups or people by native artists. Contemporary, or modern, carvers are... Tony, Richard, and Calvin Hunt of the Quacky Oodle, Joe David and Art Thompson of the New Chanulth, Nathan Jackson of the Tlingit, and Norman Tate of the Niska'a. Mr. Tate was even commissioned by the Field Museum of Chicago to carve a totem pole, and the Big Beaver totem pole still stands outside the museum today. I'd like to offer you this quote about totem poles from the book Looking at Totem Poles by Hilary Stewart. She says, The function of totem poles varied somewhat among the different people, but overall they were historical monuments or documents of great meaning and value to the cultures that carved them. They displayed images that represented a people's origins and lineages, their rights and privileges, their supernatural experiences, their exploits and achievements, their acquisitions and territories, their marriages and memorials. These recorded histories gave the people cultural identity and proclaimed their wealth and status in the village and within their nation. Many poles, old and new, still serve the same purpose. Wow, Toby, that's some great cultural history right there. I agree, Otto. It's also very important. Okay, so why don't we watch a couple more segments, then I'll show you a carving project everyone can do at home. And I do mean everyone. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our garden studio. Um, we are hoping to uh, show you a little bit of what we're doing. Um, 
Both my daughter and I love to make uh, printmaking. My name is Lavinia and uh, I'm an artist uh, in Ann Arbor. I, uh, uh, I work with printmaking and ceramics and today I'm going to show you how I like to combine the two. And Alma is going to demonstrate for you a few of the printmaking techniques. One of the things we have is a plate where we're going to use the ink. And then we have a roller that is called the brayer. We have different kinds of materials that we're going to put ink on. This is a piece of leather that has been carved. This is a piece of a basket that I found in my garden. This is a linoleum carved that was made by Alma. And this, you probably know what it is, it's just a piece of wood. We are going to try to print patterns from every single one of these. And after that, we are going to put them in clay. We also have this, which we are going to use as a stone to print by hand. Now that you've seen how cream making goes, I will show you how I like to use the same tools in making clay things. everyone, I'm Heidi and today I want to talk to you about the color wheel. Now, first you might be wondering, what is a color wheel? So the color wheel is a tool and it helps us to understand relationships between individual colors and it helps us to use them. So it's really helpful for artists when they're planning their palette to understand how the different colors look next to each other and just kind of how they, how they work together. And this was created back in 1666 by Sir Isaac Newton. On the color wheel, I've already started off with the primary colors, which are red, yellow, and blue. Now, what makes them primary is that they cannot be created from mixing two other colors. So they exist purely on their own. So the next set of colors are created by mixing two primary colors together and those will be orange, green, and purple, or violet. Kind of has both two names. So if I take a little bit of yellow, and a little bit of red, mix them around on my palette, get a very nice, bright orange. I'll paint that on that triangle in between red and yellow. Now the next color I'm going to mix, we'll use yellow and a little bit of blue. And that makes green. Now 
And then we have one more to mix together, or to mix using red and blue. And now we have that lovely shade of violet. So already I have a nice rainbow of colors on the color wheel. But you can see I still have some spaces to fill in in my circle. And those colors in between are called tertiary colors. And those are created for mixing a primary color with an adjacent secondary color. And adjacent means next door. So they're right next to each other, and it's just a primary with that color, and it'll make the colors in between. So let's go back to yellow. Take a little more yellow with that orange. And now we have this really lovely yellow orange. Okay, and now we have yellow and green. So some yellow over here. Scoop up some of that green, mix them together. Yellow, green. It reminds me of trees in the springtime when they're just starting to leaf out. They just have those little baby leaves. And it's that really nice yellowy green. And then we have the green and the blue together. Look at this really cool. Oh, I think it's really cool. I like this blue-green color. And we'll take some purple over here, just a little bit of blue. And we've got a nice blue violet. And now some red with the purple. Red, violet. We have last one to mix. Red with some orange. I'm going to get this color that reminds me of the tiger lily flowers that are blooming right now. Almost done blooming though. And there we have completed 12 color color wheel. So it really can help you see how the different colors play against each other. You can see one half is a little more warm and then it moves into cool colors. If you were to mix colors that are opposite of each other, like red and green, red and green are complementary to each other. And when you mix those two colors together, you would get gray. Same thing if you did blue and orange or yellow and purple. If you mix all three together, you'll get brown. Thanks for joining me in learning about the color wheel. Okay, I bet you guessed what all these are. These are erasers. So this is something that you might use if you're an artist because it's easy to transport works pretty well this is definitely an artist eraser you need it to make it softer and this will work on either pencil or pen brain go away turtle with baby see you later Cow. Taking it out. And finally, Samurai. Whoa! These are all erasers.
All right, everybody, we're gonna get started on our at-home carving project that you can do. Now, we're not gonna be using wood and real carving knives. What we're gonna be using is soap and plastic cutlery. Now, I've chosen ivory soap because it's really soft and also it floats, which is gonna be really important for the end product. All right, let's take a look. All right, so today we're going to be carving a boat out of soap. We're going to need our bar of ivory. I've got a plastic spoon, a plastic knife, a pair of scissors, a straw cut in half, and you're going to need something to make a sail with. I chose this baseball card because I love this guy's glasses. So what we're going to do is we are going to shape the boat out of this bar of soap. Now I'm going to use the back of this plastic knife and I'm going to drag it towards me to remove a little bit of soap at a time until I round the bottom so that it looks like a boat. When you do this step, it's better to take a little bit off at a time because you can't add the soap back on. And don't let me forget, I put down a tablecloth to catch all the soap. You can also push the knife to remove the soap. So I'm going to shape this up. Alright, as you can see, I've rounded the bottom of the boat. So there's one view, there's the other view, and you can see it's nice and round. Now I need to make the front of the boat. So I am going to mark a triangle up here at the front, like that, and then I can start carving that off so that it comes to a nice point. All right, so the front of my boat is now pointy. Now what I want to do is round off this section here. So I'm going to start removing slowly and carefully. Until the front of the boat is rounded as well. Now, we need somewhere for someone to sit in our boat, so I'm going to take my spoon, and right here in the middle, I'm going to carve out a little circle and take some of the soap out. So I'm just going to use a scooping motion with the spoon until I've got a nice little well that something can fit in. Just like that. All right, so our boat is nicely shaped. It's got a nice well, and because it's made of the ivory soap, it will float. Next, I'm going to take the straw and gently insert it into the front. And then I'm going to take my baseball card and I'm going to tape it to the front. So now I have a boat with a sail, and the SS Paul Gibson is ready to sail. You can take it into the sink or the bath, place it gently on top of the water, and the boat will float. All right, folks, well, that was your carving project, and that's it for this week's episode of The Saturday Show. Don't forget, for more awesome resources, you can go to aadl.org slash The Saturday Show. And if you'd like to write in to me or Otto, or Otto, you can write an email to tss at aadl.org and we'll feature your note or your drawing or your recipe or your picture on one of the upcoming episodes of The Saturday Show. Until then, bye!